Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Guillermo Salatier, your host for today. Uh, I am the, uh, the I am uh, the, of course hosting perspectives on energy here on Things Like Hawaii, and uh, my day job I am a director of international services for HSI, where I uh, am a subject matter expert in the industrial skills for the utility industry. And uh, again, welcome to today's episode. Uh, today we're going to be talking about basically. Uh, preparation for cold weather peak, right? It's uh, winter electricity stress and uh, maybe load shedding. Hopefully they don't do any of that. But uh, it's a big discussion kind of how the industry is doing as we uh, just got past a few months ago, past the summer peak, and uh, with some lessons learned from that particular experience for the industry and then uh, how we're looking as we approach the winter. Uh, there's a lot of different opportunities that, that were seized to make improvements, but then we're also expecting uh, there's what happened back in Texas a few years ago with the uh, cold weather snap is still fresh in our minds. So we'll, discuss, we'll be discussing that a little bit on today's show. So <clears throat> what did we learn from the um, last winter cold snap that uh, ERCOT in Texas experienced? And uh, one of the reasons being is uh, that aside from the actual shortages on um, our fuel, shortages on the uh, potential output of some of the generators. Uh, they had had freeze protection already uh, in place from a previous event nearly 10 years pr prior. And at that point, they protected down to those temperatures. And the expectation was the temperatures would never get that low again, because you know, uh, preparing for every additional degree of uh, colder, colder weather is, is, is an exponentially higher cost. So if you are forecasting that you're unlikely to face that kind of event again, then you protect just to that worst case event in history, which would have been back in uh, 2000, I think it was 2012. So uh, fast forward about what, several years later, uh, less than a decade later, and we come across the experience that we had uh, last year, right, where, where we had the problem with um, you know, having a capacity shortfall in Texas. Where we saw issues not just with their renewables, but also with their with their fleet of uh, uh, conventional uh, combustion turbine generators, not having adequate uh, fuel reserves, and even getting issues with the pipeline, getting all their pipelines and getting fuel to their different combustion turbines and combined cycle plants. Uh, some of that is not just the um, electric utility infrastructure, but also the uh, natural gas infrastructure. A lot of those compressor stations were having issues with their controls, uh, much like we saw you know, in the previous event, right? Some of their instrumentation and controls were freezing up. Uh, this time it was a little bit different. Uh, they had a lot of problems with the output of all, the, all of their renewable resources. Mainly their solar sites were, were not able to produce. Actually, uh, all of them were covered up in snow. And um, sadly, a lot of the wind turbines also were not, were not able to give the output that was expected. So naturally, you know, you end up with some um, a situation where they had to do some feeder rotation and uh, used up all of the available demand site management, which is the interruptible load and a lot of these residential accounts. So um, again, more lessons learned. Um, quite a bit of changes were you know have were planned. Some quite a few of them have been implemented in preparation for the next event. So here we are, and uh, we're looking at uh, went to a. Uh, webinar with the USCA on on, uh, on an outlook for the industry, how they're looking, for example, for this uh, winter. And for the most part, they seemed okay. Uh, the preparations were, were, were made and uh, they seem to be in pretty good shape, pretty confident they'll be able to meet demand for this coming winter and, and, and the peak. So um, given that, you know, I, I feel pretty good about um, about how the industry in itself has responded to these events and how they prepared for this next cold weather. Um, the, Notwithstanding the fact that you know it's it's uh, you you have issues occasionally with some of the renewables, right? Whereas um, if you have a problem with uh, solar sites producing their their forecasted megawatts, uh, that becomes impossible if a lot of those panels have um, snow collecting on the surface. You're just not going to get the same amount of power as you, you would hope, if any at all. So uh, with that in mind, right? It's it's we're we're looking at. Uh, a winter peak, but let's also look at what happened in California or what almost happened in California uh, this last summer during their uh, the summer peaks. And they were in the process of doing an interruptible load 
uh, and they were also issuing energy emergency alerts level two. And we'll talk about what those are in a minute. But uh, they were they were doing public appeals. They were reducing customer load by shutting up appliances. Usually, a customer signs up for one of those programs in uh, demand side management, and they you know they get paid to be to be available to have their air conditioner, water heaters, and pool pumps shut down in an event of a, of a capacity sh- shortfall with generation. So uh, clear. You know, Clearly, they, they, they made use of that resource in California, and they were able to get through those, those peak load days without having to uh, rotate too many feeders. So luckily for them, you know, they, they, I think they got lucky. Uh, honestly, it's, it's, it wasn't really a fuel issue. It was just a matter of having enough generation available to meet that peak load. Uh, they were already uh, maxed out on their imports, and they could just not bring any more generation online. Sadly, a lot of that had to do with the fact that they retired a lot of their uh, a lot of their fleet, and and they replaced that with renewables, and and uh, e- even so, that wasn't enough. And of course, with the variability in renewables, it wasn't enough to meet that load, especially during lighting peaks. So for them, they had they had quite a bit of challenges. Now, touched upon a couple of topics here on the uh, demand side management and being able to interrupt. Um, basically interrupting appliances in a customer's home uh, voluntarily, right? So a customer sign up for these programs, they usually get paid uh, a couple of dollars a month for, for being on there, sometimes as, might, as much as 16 or $20. But really what it is is to, you know, they make themselves available to, to have their either their pool pumps or water heaters or their air conditioners or their, or their actual heat, uh, heaters shut down during an event of, a, of one of these uh, capacity shortfalls. Um, a great resource, right? And it's it's uh, usually one um, a lot of bang for the buck when it comes from the utility perspective, as far as investment goes. However, um, not a lot of customers stay on once they get hit. Usually, a customer will will be on this program for years and never never get hit. And then the way the day they do get hit, utility had had a need. Then you'll see that um, they tend to sign off maybe. Uh, a couple of weeks right after that, because I guess those few minutes or so those couple of hours of having that being inconvenienced was was a probably more than they wanted to endure. Sadly enough, though, it's it's um, when you don't have that type of uh, resource available and more more customers sign off, uh, that the impact of that type of resource you know diminishes, and then the, the utility loses that loses that um, that type of um, tool. So now the the next, uh, the next thing we're looking at as well, I mean, regarding that particular shortfall is is winter, and we're expecting some some cold winters coming up, and we've already seen a few a few um, storms that have already stressed the system quite a bit, and we're going to see hopefully uh, what the industry has done in order to prepare for this cold weather. Um, according to it, it's, it was NERC, it was. Uh, Cal ISO, New York ISO, and a few other entities, you know, that that were at the webinar uh, earlier this week that I attended, they seemed pretty confident that, that you know everybody was ready. Uh, ERCOT, WEC, even the Eastern Connection, so pretty confident. I feel pretty good about that. Um, but you know, there's there's always like that cautious optimism, right? Um, you should be fine as long as you don't lose one or two generators, right? And that's usually the challenge when it comes to uh, meeting your your winter peak. And of course, the other challenge is, you know, say you don't have any any fuel fuel capacity shortfalls. That's usually one of the things that that, that presents a challenge when the, approaching these winter peaks. Now, as I was saying earlier, uh, energy emergency alerts, and and those are those are usually issued uh, by the reliability coordinators uh, at the request of a balancing authority. Balancing authority is balancing load and generation, so they are they are expecting a uh, a shortage on their ability to supply load. They usually uh, coordinate with their reliability coordinator, the RCs, to begin to to decide what energy emergency energy alert level to issue. So what are they? There's three levels, right? And then there's a fourth one, energy emergency alert level zero, which means it's an all clear. So let's start with one. Energy EEA level one uh, describes uh, having all of your resources are currently online. You've bought everything you can, and you're you're meeting all your load. You haven't shut anybody off. You haven't uh, 
use any of your demand side management. Uh, you know, you haven't used any of those like uh, tools to to reduce customer load by shutting up appliances. Everything is pretty much running as running as usual. Um, it's just and and you're able to to withstand losing your largest generator, meaning your most severe single contingency. So that's on alert level one. I mean, meaning you're right at the edge, but you still have enough of those continuous reserves to be able to withstand the loss of your worst possible case scenario, which is, you know, is it's like a like like you're in a watch when it comes to like a hurricane, for example. So you're at that stage. Um, if the load is a little higher than you forecasted, and now you're getting you're eating into that that reserve margin. And say you do happen to lose that largest uh, generating re- unit you, know, you have, you know, that most severe single contingency, now you would have to uh, e- escalate that to a EEA level two. And then this event means that if you do lose that, that generator, that the, the largest generator in your system, you will likely not be able to support that. And you will be forced to, at that point, maybe uh, rotate feeders, which is you know, shedding customers or using the demand side management, which is shutting up appliances in customers' homes voluntarily, of course. So uh, usually any EA2, um, there, you know, there's the, your, that's not issued right at the point where, where you get into it, you issue that you know, some time ahead, right? So if you're seeing that your load is progressing and you're noticing that by a certain time, a few hours from now, you're going to have that kind of a shortfall, usually that EEA is issued uh, way ahead of time. And uh, one of the things that there that that you know, the certain set of actions that you know go into effect. Usually, once you issue those any of those alerts, uh, all the other BAs and generators in your and TOPs even in your region are alerted to what's happening. So usually, though, they can bring a generator that was, they may have been off for a reserve shutdown or just not being run that day. Well, they may you know offer to bring it online and sell you that power. If you have the space available in your in your transmission to bring it in, right? So those are some of the solutions that can be presented given that alert, right? Uh, you usually get help from your neighbors, or you're able to buy power from some other facility somewhere else. So that's definitely a, a an advantage having that, right? It's uh, also buying emergency power from other other places. Uh, now, of course, uh, also if you're if you're about to, or you're already using uh, the demand side management, that also puts you in an EEA two automatically. Or even doing public appeals, like we saw happening in California, where the governor and the, and the power company was asking everybody to uh, go ahead and turn up the thermostats. So you know, from a seventy-two to a seventy-eight, or even to an eighty degrees Fahrenheit, so you're not you're not uh, consuming as much energy. So you know, it's all different tools to be able to pretty much uh, do some what they call peak shaving, uh, and you're reducing your peak load by. Maybe a couple of hundred megawatts, two hundred megawatts overall in a twenty thousand megawatt system. Uh, pretty significant, you know. That that's that's probably uh, one entire combustion turbine site, or half of a typical uh, combined cycle plant. Now, uh, as you're wondering, you know, EEA three, right? What, what constitutes getting into that sort of condition? Well, in that case, now you're looking at um, when you're about to, or you already are. Uh, basically dropping customers altogether. They call that firm load shedding. So if you're at that stage already, right, um, it, it's pretty much you, if you run out of options, you just don't have enough power to just meet the load. Forget about losing a generator. You, you can't lose a single generator at this point anymore. So uh, you just don't have enough to with what you have on. So in this case, now you're now you're asking for help and you are already, um, you know, hope you know, have already gotten all the help you can get and see if anybody has any more. But more than likely, you're already um, putting customers in the dark at this point. So that's an EEA three, and uh, those are pretty severe uh, when when you're entering these conditions. Um, hopefully, we don't see any of those in this winter. But um, I think for ERCOT specifically, uh, especially the lessons learned from their winter peak last time, uh, they have uh, enrolled a lot more of those uh, demand side management customers. So you'll be seeing a lot more of these options, right? When it comes to uh, peak shaving, the challenge there is, of course, is um, you are in the middle of the winter peak. You're it's cold, and then you're shutting people's um, heaters off, or you're turning off their central ACs or central heaters for like 15, 20 minutes, right? Well, I mean, if if it's just for like maybe that one hour during the peak, you know, it shouldn't be too too much of a hardship to endure for these customers, right? Uh, certainly a lot better than actually rotating feeders where you lose everything altogether. 
um, not to mention the fact that you you might even impact some of the uh, compressor stations, right? Some of these places if you lose transmission assets as well. So definitely something to look at. Uh, other parts of the country, the Northeast, the Midwest, all that, they, they've done quite a bit of uh, uh, winterization of their facilities, their plants, their gas uh, compressor stations as well. So it should be in pretty good shape at this point. But but again, I mean, the world that we'll be watching closely, how we as an industry here in this country manage these resources. Um, and that's just, you know, the U.S. You know, there, there's definitely concerns in Europe right now with them having adequate uh, natural gas uh, reserves to be able to supply energy during the cold winter. Of course, it gets a lot colder over there than it does here. So for them, that's, that's going to be a, quite a big concern. But right now, let's, let's in, at least for this episode, let's worry about the U.S. and Canada and how we are shaping up to look at the, um, these winter peaks. Uh, for now, um, one of the other things we noticed is that um, we normally have a um, load forecasting in some cases that you know it can be anywhere anywhere between one to three percent error uh, because it, it a load forecast depends on historical load uh, of course and it, it all begins with forecasted temperatures so doing doing a weather forecast right for a particular area will certainly you know it's it's never error free there's always going to be some level of uncertainty and with that level of uncertainty, you know, you you have to accommodate for that type that has a direct impact on on load. Uh, you're looking at uh, the same weather pattern that you had last year based on a similar day, uh, similar pattern of the day, for example. So a load pattern on a Sunday is completely different than a load pattern on a Thursday, for example. Uh, people are at home versus people are are at work. Um, so, so that in itself, you know, uh, introduces error into the whole forecast. So once you have that happening and, and you run what they call unit commitment, which is the, uh, usually any type of software used to be able to, to be able to schedule and dispatch, uh, generating units, both reliably and economically, you know, that of course, you know, has to plays a role. So you don't want to have an AV generator running, uh, you know, at the wrong schedule because that becomes expensive and you're also burning fuel, much needed fuel. But at the same time, you don't want to have, um, you know, don't want to schedule generators too late because then you won't have them when you need them. So that's one challenge. And the other challenge, of course, is having a limited number of starts due to environmental constraints. Some of these combustion turbines can only start twice a day because of emissions. So if you have a unit starting in the morning, they have to shut down uh, after the morning peak, and then it has to start again in the late early afternoon. Uh, and it, it trips, it may not be available for that particular time of the day. And of course, that presents the uh, balancing authority and the generator operator with, with some with some real headaches in that case. So different things to consider here. Um, certainly something to to watch as we're getting ready. Um, what advice I would have as, as, as customers, you know, for example, I, 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 I definitely have um, some preparation in mind, you know, where, whether you're 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 looking at uh, having your your vehicle uh, topped off, you know, in case you may need that. Uh, if you have, for example, a generator at home, uh, make sure you have some fuel ready just in case. Uh, kind of the same way we deal with the hurricanes here in the uh, in 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 the uh, east coast of Florida and the Gulf, right? You know, it's it's kind of the same way with cold weather, except now you're you know, cold weather can 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 be a lot more dangerous than dealing with heat, right? Heat, all, all you're dealing with is, is heat and then dehydration. But with cold weather, it's, you know, so, uh, there were quite a number of fatalities in that case, right? So uh, if you do have a generator, just be ready. And in some cases, usually you're going to rely on a shelter as well if the forecast at load is getting, is getting pretty bad uh, when it comes to uh, the winter winter weather in that case. So uh, it's a matter, to, a matter of preparing. Uh, not, again, it's not like it's 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 almost like a hurricane in some regards, but a little bit different in others. Uh, weather's cold enough, you know, your water might freeze, your food might freeze. So you might need to actually have something adequate to be able to generate heat. Uh, but then again, not indoors because of the fact that if you're you know you're you're burning any combustibles indoors, you can really find yourself in trouble with with uh, suffocation issues, right? So or carbon monoxide poisoning. But uh, along with that, you know, just a matter of being ready. Uh, we won't really foresee any, any any potential problems with this, but uh, just you know, just take your usual precautions when it comes to this extreme weather, and uh, and I think we'll we'll do okay. Um, the other thing to consider as well is um, 
as we're looking at uh, electric vehicles uh, and probably also battery storage in, in, in households, a lot of these batteries don't do as well in cold weather as they would in mild or warm weather. So that is another thing to consider. You know, th those few of you that probably have um, some kind of battery storage devices at home, you know, you can definitely uh, have a challenge when it comes to looking at the capacity of those devices as you're um, heading into into this particular like dip in, in temperatures. So just keep that in mind. Uh, always consider a backup. Having a small inverter in, inverter generator, um, two thousand watt generator, is actually pretty much all you need. A couple of gallons of fuel, and that'll get you to those peaks. Uh, or you can sit in your car and just you know run that heater. Uh, ho hopefully outside of your garage. You know you don't want to suffocate in the garage. But uh, definitely different options. Um, you know, running a running a generator outside can definitely uh, run the extension cords, and you know you can run a small space heater, electric space heater in your in when in a room, and you can keep yourself comfortable and warm. And those generators uh, can run about maybe two or three hours, right? With with the amount of fuel they carry, and that's just maybe a couple of gallons. So this can definitely get you through those peaks, right? But that's, you know, worst case scenario, right? Uh, usually, if not, it's just you can probably uh, set it out in your car if you had to, or just, you know, it's, but, uh, if if you want to stay in, in your house, usually for the most part, if your home's already warm, you can probably, and well insulated, you can probably enjoy that residual heat for about maybe two, maybe three days depending on how, how warm your house was when it finally lost power. So um, that is the best advice I can give you. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and put them in the comments below. Uh, I'll try my best to, uh, to respond to them. And uh, again, thank you all for watching. Um, again, we'll, we'll be watching what happens with this winter. I'm, I'm sure I'll do a, another episode once the season is over as we begin the spring and see how we did. Uh, I, I know that right now, winterization, and cold weather preparation for all these uh, generating facilities and the uh, and the natural gas and fuel infrastructure is quite quite the hot topic and uh, everybody's watching to see how how well we are prepared and more importantly what else will be can be done to make sure we're, we're ready. So, all right. Well, thank you again. This is all I have for today. Um, again, if I'm interested in learning more about industrial skills and how the uh, electric utility works, uh, just go to hsi.com. And in there, uh, find uh, industrial skills training. And uh, we have quite the topics under whether it's uh, operating power plants or it's running gas infrastructure or actually op or actually uh, system operations training when it comes to electric utilities. So again, thank you very much. And, uh, and also wishing everybody happy holidays and a happy new year. Uh, it looks like this will be my last show for the year. I won't be back until January. So uh, once again, um, always fun and enjoy the rest of your year. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.